Um, well, yeah, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to today's online workshop with the topic on export financing for transport infrastructure project in Indonesia. This online workshop is initiated by the Federal Ministry of Economic and Energy and KFW IPEX Bank GmbH, a leading German bank focusing on international project and export finance in cooperation with German Singapore Chamber of Commerce and Econet. My name is Olivia Noor and I'm the head of market entry services at the German Indonesian Chamber of Industry and Commerce, also known as Econit in Indonesia. Today I will be your host during the webinar. Before we start the session, I would like to point out that you can submit your question at the end of the presentation using the question button on the control panel. Simply type in your question, name of the speaker you would like to ask, click submit and your question will be read out later on during the Q&A session. Alternatively, you can click the option raise hand, then your microphone will be activated by the organizer so you can address your question directly. This online workshop is recorded for internal purposes only and the presentation material will be sent to the participant one hour after the online uh, workshop. Regarding the agenda, the workshop will be opened by Mr. Larry Brown, Vice President for Infrastructure Project at KFW IPEX Bank GmbH, followed by Mr. Markus Leitholm, Senior Manager German Export Finance at the German Singapore Chamber of Commerce, and Mr. Jens Oliver Schinzel, Director for Infrastructure Project at KFW IPEX Bank GmbH. So before we start, uh, we will conduct a short polling. Please vote on the question that appear on your screen. I will leave it open for one minute to get the result. So the question is, how have you heard about export financing before? We are still waiting for more votes. Okay, so we will share the poll quotes. Have you heard about export financing before? So the answer is yes, 68% of the participants know about the export financing. So uh, now I would like to hand over the session to Mr. Wari Brown. This the stage is yours. Thank you, Olivia. I appreciate that. Uh, do I have control of the screen now? Uh, here we go. Perfect. Uh, thank you, thank you, Olivia. Uh, on behalf of uh, Jan Jens and KFW and IPEX, thank you and Econet. Marcus, of course, thank you. And to all the participants for joining today, I think we have at least 30 already. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, appreciate your time. Uh, should be, yeah, we'll keep it within an hour and uh, look forward to your, to your questions at the end as well. Uh, yeah, so it's a, a, a webinar, a workshop on export financing. Specifically, we'll focus on transportation infrastructure projects in Indonesia. And um, yeah, without further ado, we will uh, get into it. So the, the first thing I just wanted to cover, because in Indonesia, it can be a little bit confusing. Uh, there is KFW, which has an office in Jakarta, and there's KFW IPEX Bank, who, who I work for in this presentation is, is, is led by. Uh, KFW IPEX Bank is 100% owned by KFW. KFW is the German promotional bank. Uh, they essentially, within Indonesia, they do government to government lending. So it's 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 very specific. So it's only government to government lending. We are a commercial bank. Um, so you would be familiar with, I'm sure, lots of other international banks. We operate similarly to them, uh, with with a bit of a, a difference in that we focus on medium to long term lending. That's our area of, of, of expertise. Uh, we do a lot of export financing in particular. Uh, and yeah, a lot of the financings we do are around the infrastructure space. 
Uh, you can see, uh, you'll get this presentation later. I won't go through all the numbers and details, but you can see we cover, you know, most of the main um, sectors you might think of, shipping, power and renewables, uh, aviation, rail, uh, mining, oil and gas, infrastructure, and then some general industries such as, um, you know, telco, healthcare, pharma, automotive, uh, plus we have an FI and trading commodities team. Uh, so most of those would have uh, some activity in Indonesia. Today, obviously, we're focusing on, on infrastructure. Um, yeah, so we have offices around the world. I'm based in Singapore. Uh, we have a rep office here, so we're looking at you know market entry into into the into APAC, um, you know origination, client coverage, and so on. And Jens, my colleague, who you'll hear from later, is based in Frankfurt, and that's our our headquarters. Uh, I'm going to hand over to Marcus to introduce himself. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ari, and thank you for the invitation today for today's webinar and the organization from Econit for today's webinar. Uh, my name is Marcus Leichum. I'm located here in Singapore and responsible for the Competence Center for German Export Finance here in the region. Um, there are at the moment, two, uh, with my competence center in Singapore, there are two other competence centers in place. One in Dubai, where Eva Steinhaus is responsible for the MENA region and Pakistan. One in Nairobi, where Eva Rösler is responsible for North and East Africa. And I'm here in Singapore, cover the market um, Southeast Asia and Bangladesh, but to some degree also China. And Indonesia is one of my, yeah, I would say one of the hottest markets from our perspective, or the top three markets in, in my region, besides Vietnam and Bangladesh. And I'm quite eager to learn more about also from, from you today, um, about your activities maybe. Uh, the idea of the competence centers is to provide on one hand information uh, related to Euler Hermes. We are very closely linked to the German ECA in Hamburg. Um, and besides providing information, be part of events like today or organize uh, information events like today, but we provide also a, a additional um, support in actual transactions for exporters, banks, but also especially we have a focus, a local focus on importers in the region. I would like to build up a network to in, uh, investors or in importers, especially in Indonesia. And today I have the opportunity to get in contact with you in the infrastructure field of Indonesia. The idea is also to give you an explanation about Euler Hermes. If you have questions to, to for example, uh, to Euler Hermes itself, I try to provide you assistance for the processes of Euler Hermes to the products. What are the benefits for you as an importer? I would be like, I would like that you to get in contact with me, and therefore I place here also in my contact details, my email address, and my phone number, and you could easily reach out to me, and uh, we would be eager to. Also, my colleagues in the other countries would be eager to assist you and try to help you. And now I would like to hand over to again this is the next slide to the KWRPX to all I mean. Thank you. So I think most of you you'll have seen in the in the in the invite the agenda, but you can see it again here. And we'll just uh, yeah. So the idea today we will focus on export financing generally. The cases we will use, the specific processes will be focused on Euler Hermes. That's the German export credit agency. Uh, so just just to be clear on that. Uh, and I guess uh, we had the poll at the start. Two thirds of people know about export financing, one third don't. So when we're talking today about export financing, you'll hear the word ECA, that's export credit agency. So export financing, ECAs, export credit agencies, these are all almost synonymous. So an export credit agency is typically a government sponsored entity. So in Germany, it's Euler Hermes, in Finland, it's Finvera, and all of the rich exporting, all of the OECD plus, you know, plus China have these agencies and their job is to promote exports from their home country. You promote exports, you promote jobs within the domestic economy uh, and, and so on. So that's, that's the sort of the background of it. And why it's of interest to you, we'll, we'll come to shortly. Now back to infrastructure financing and why we think export financing is a useful financing product for all of you guys who are looking at infrastructure. Infrastructure is very capex heavy, very long life of the project, of the asset. And yeah, very you don't often you don't really earn any revenue until it's you know you've had a huge amount of 
of capex go into it, uh, maybe a, a four or five, six year construction period, and so on. Uh, so for a very long term, uh, a project with a very long life cycle with very high capex, you need long term financing. You know, if you're the, the, the in a port, for example, all the ship to shore cranes, all the mobile equipment, all of that, very, very expensive. On the airport side, likewise, people movers, whether it's hundreds of, you know, escalators and, and um, or even, uh, you know, monorail or light rail systems between terminals, baggage handling can cost, well, anywhere from several million to hundreds of millions of dollars, the electrical systems and so on. All of these are very expensive equipment and take a long time to, to, to repay. So that's the idea, is, is we're looking at CapEx heavy industries, it's, it's long term and long term financing required. Um, the good thing with infrastructure is once it is up and running, it's typically very stable business uh, with stable, strong cash flows and, you know, notwithstanding every, I don't know, every so often some huge, uh, some black swan events such as COVID, uh, where obviously the you know, the airports, which typically have seen you know very strong growth and, and stable, uh, they've been badly affected. But typically speaking, it's it's stable and strong. And and that that's the reason I mention that is this is what investors like. Investors want you know long term stable stable and growing assets. So you can finance infrastructure assets with debt, with equity, and uh, also whether it's operational or greenfield. Uh, we have financed greenfield ports, for example. Uh, it is it is feasible, uh, and of course, once they're very large and they're they're operating, you know, the bond market is, is another option on the debt side. Uh, I'll run through. Uh, okay, through these. So these are this is what you think about when you're thinking of of financing something. Why do you want to finance it? Is it is it a greenfield asset? Is it brownfield? What's the size? It makes a big difference. If it's 50 million, you maybe only need one bank, if it's, you know, a billion dollars, you, you will need multiple banks. Uh, what's the tenor you're looking for? If it's, you know, if it's some mobile equipment, maybe five, seven year tenor is, is enough. You know, if it's a whole greenfield port, well, you probably want as long as you can get, you know, 14, 17 years, you know, you'll take the longest tenor you can get. And timing, of course. So this one's critical when it comes to um, export financing. It we'll, we'll get to the process later, but you know, if you're doing a corporate loan from your local bank versus a syndicated loan versus an uh, export financing versus a multilateral, they'll all take a different amount of time. So if you need the money now, you know, you may not be able to do. You know, if you need it within a month, you may not be able to do export financing, and certainly not multilateral financing. So. These are sort of four of the key parameters that you want to think about when you're when you're thinking about financing. And the currency, of course. Typically, infrastructure assets are local currency. Uh, some of the transshipment ports may have uh, you know, dollar revenues, but typically they are local currency. Yeah, I thought I'd run through some of the key the key options and some of the pros and cons. So bond market. Once you know when the market's you know open and and it's uh, it's stable, you know it can provide very large volumes. Of course, Pilindo two has done ten and thirty year bonds. PLN of course taps the market all the time. So you know Indonesian SOEs in the infrastructure space do have access to the global bond markets, and you can get yeah large amounts, good tenor, good pricing. Of course, a bond is you know, typically a bond is a bond. It's you know you get the money all at once, but you, you know you may you may not need it all at once. It's not like a loan where you can draw it down over you know, the availability period, a one, two, three year period. So yeah, there are obviously pros and cons associated with it. Export financing, we will get into a lot more detail on this. It can provide large volumes. You can do greenfield projects, the pricing, especially. When times are a little bit difficult, when the perception of risk is, you know, it's a bit high, then the, the export financing ECA deals are often a very, can provide very attractive terms, long-term and attractive terms. Uh, there are, of course, like anything else, there are some other issues with it, some of the, the, the timing issue, the structure. So, 
for example, it's always, almost always, semi-annual repayments, unless it's a non-recourse project finance structure. The eligibility, the ECA, the, so if it's the German ECA, they're only going to support you if you're buying a material amount of equipment and services from Germany. So if you buy your equipment from, from China, you cannot turn to the German ECA for financing. That's not how it works. Commercial banks. So, oh, on the export finance, I just uh, wanted to mention. So, Palindo 3, for example, has done an export financing about six, seven years ago. Um, so, they, so they, they have experience with it. Commercial banks, you can do, obviously, bilateral loans, syndicated loans, like Palindo 1 did about three, four years ago. They tapped the local banks for a syndicated loan. It's very fast, uh, you know, you, often local currency. Uh, however, of course, perhaps the, the quantum, the size, is maybe not as much as you can get on the international markets. And then pricing can vary uh, depending on what's going on in the credit cycle. So in the COVID, the COVID times we're in at the moment, it, it might be tough to get long-term financing from your, from your commercial banks because of all the, the stress in the system. And of course, there are multilateral development banks. And I think this is um, in the infrastructure space in Indonesia, this has been used quite a lot. So of course, the, probably the, the most famous institution operating there would be JICA, the Japanese, and you know they finance, I think, some of the airports, for example, the, the new terminal in Jakarta. Um, and I mean, KFW would do some stuff as well, but it's maybe not on the transportation infrastructure, more on water and some of the power. But you can get very difficult projects, so greenfield projects, you know, maybe it's a breakwater, something that's very difficult for commercial institutions to finance. The multilateral and development banks can be extremely helpful there, but of course, can take a long time to get these uh, these financings together. Uh, that's just the way the multilaterals work. I think again, handing over to you. Yes, thank you so much, Rory and Marcus, and uh, hello from my side as well, Salamat Zoe. Um, uh, taking further, so what we are doing on KFW IPEX side on the ECA covered uh, financing structure. So we are bank using the scheme since the 1960s, and obviously Euler Hermes is one of the biggest uh, contributor to our portfolio of ECA covered financing with a portfolio of roughly 15 billion euro. But um, to be fair, we are not only using Euler Hermes, so we are working with lots of other European ECAs and also Asian ECAs, ECAs together. So when you look on the graphics here, you can see that 2015 was a high year, then there was some volatility, but now you're seeing again an increasing trend in ECA covered financing with Euler Hermes. And um, we are doing a lot of stuff. So Bilateral deals with 10 million to 50 million for one or two ship to shore cranes, for example, but also large scale project financing with billions of dollars or euros in a leading structuring role. So um, we, do, we, we can offer all of these various expertise to you. Next slide, please. Um, as Rory already mentioned, so ECA, Export Trade Agency, is an agency who's working on behalf of the respective government. And what they want to do is they want to do to promote the exports from their from their countries, exports in goods or services. And in order to do so, so they provide a cover, a cover for the financing. So the banks get a get a cover on the financing. And um, therefore, this provides you some of the beneficials, for example, long tenor, competitive pricing, and mitigation of country risk for the bank, which obviously also drives the pricing. And as Rory already mentioned, it is a new bucket of liquidity. Apart from the other sources, you can use this for invest investments, which you are doing, uh, and where you have supplies from foreign countries. And also, not uh, also to mention here, there's also from some countries very competitive fixed interest rates available. So 
Mark, I would now hand over to Marcus, who even drives you further in the details of ECAs in, in on the example of Euler Hermes. Yes, thank you, Jens. Thank you, Rari, for the introduction also of some parts what Euler Hermes does and is doing, uh, especially here in the market. I would give you now a bit of the official framework behind the German ECA. There are the federal government guarantees in place to is in a German foreign trade and investment promotion scheme. The export credit guarantees um, and the untied loan guarantees, they have been very effective instruments uh, for the federal government for decades. It's over 70 years now that Euro Hermes is active in the market. They're the, the most important products are the export credit guarantees, also known in the market as Hermes Cover, which protect uh, German exporters and the banks financing their activities against political and commercial risks. Uh, which means with a coverage quota up to 95% of the risk. And what already has mentioned, what already was mentioned by Jens and Averari, it's that it's very beneficial for banks and even the exporters, especially for banks who provide financing, because then you have 95% will be covered and will be laid on the risk perspective to the triple A rating of the Federal Republic of Germany and therefore benefiting for you as an investor in the market and in, in leading to um, low interest margins, fee structures, which is quite, comp uh, yeah, quite um, maybe um, quite interesting for you to consider in your activities. We have also the untied loan guarantees in place, uh, which are supporting raw material projects uh, abroad that are very important for the Federal Republic and the German market as well. And both um, instruments um, they play a very important role to foster economic growth and protect and creating jobs in Germany. But on the other hand, we also in the last years, we have now a clearer focus also on the in investor side. And that's also the reason I'm here in the region to provide also investors and uh, importer support, uh, local support to build up a network here to reach out to you and to explain you in the more detail what Euro Hermes, the German ECA is doing. And um, Euro Hermes is um, acting on behalf of the Federal Republic of Germany. Um, it's, it's also considered as the mandatory of the Federal Republic and it's known as the Export Credit Agency of Germany, in short ECA. Uh, why could you please go to the next slide? If you talk about Euro Hermes, um, you know, as I mentioned already, Euro Hermes is quite is active since 70 years now um, on behalf of the Federal Republic of Germany, is providing protection against commercial and political risk and almost worldwide. Um, we have we are active in I think we provided cover for 154 countries in the world, most related to the emerging and developing markets. Our total cost exposure. Uh, currently is 88 point billion, but we have a budget up to 160 billion. And I, I can imagine that maybe during the uh, crisis time right now, or maybe the post, actual post crisis time after COVID-19, we will see a, maybe a high demand for coverage from Euler Hermes in the market. For 2019, um, our annual cover volume was up to 20 billion, um, 12.5 billion related to the single transactions with a mid-term, long-term perspective. Um, what is it? 8.5 billion was related to the whole turnover policies for the short term related transactions. But more important also for the audience today is that the transportation and infrastructure sector was the number one sector from Euro Hermes uh, with 67% of the total exposure uh, uh, related to, to this sector. I think we have a high knowledge in the market. Could you please go to the next slide, please? We are active and the partner of suppliers, but also for importers in several markets uh, ranging from international trade, transportation, logistics, engineering, social development, capital, heavy equipment, renewables, infrastructure, you name it. And um, I mean, we, we are quite active um, uh, since 17 years and all these industries have a high experience as well. Uh, since you have seen the numbers 21 billion last year uh, speaking for itself, uh, that we have a high number of, uh, yeah, that we are able to provide coverage uh, in all these markets, we have 400 employees um, working for Euro Hermes to support the activities. But also, the, you have to consider we are not providing coverage for all sectors. There are also sectors like um, coal-fired plants um, and also um, um, what was it? A nuclear for a nuclear power plants are not considered or would be not considered from us at the moment to receive coverage. Um, I would like to highlight here that we will be eager to provide you support in all these markets. We have also certain uh, changes in place for renewable finance, for example. We have a, no, a stronger green focus, which is also clear when, when we 
skipped uh, more the focus from um, coal fire plants and nuclear fire plants more to renewables. Um, and you have to keep in mind that Eurohomes is a very um, reliable partner from also the importer side. Please, next slide. I would like to highlight you with this slide short the one of our core products. And since we have a webinar today with uh, KFW IPEX, it will be lead to the the buyer credit cover. It's an interesting cover for you as an importer. The you here on the slide is representing the importer side. You as an importer, um, you will enter into a commercial contract with on the right hand side the exporter. You obliged uh, related to the OECD regulations. Um, I think it was not mentioned there. The OECD is the framework for all ECAs behind. We have we play after all these rules. They're quite important, and there is a requirement for down payment of 15%, which means for, from you, you as an investor side, 85% of the contract value from the commercial contract could be covered from Euro Hermes plus 100% of the Euro Hermes premium, just to inform you. Um, after the exporter has signed a contract or as a negotiation for, with a contact, even you as an investor would maybe think it would be very useful for us to have a long-term financing in place. And now it's critical what, what was mentioned all the day today. The timing is often an essential issue. You have to inform or you should inform your home is quite early in, especially in the structuring period and negotiation period with the exporter. And also this, I would like to highlight, I'm here in the region, especially for these tasks as well. Just reach out to me or to the colleagues here in the market from KFW IPEX. Oh, you, okay, I don't see. It would be great then to, we would be eager to support you, help you to find a structure which is benefiting you and maybe then also save you time in the end. Now coming back to the slide, after the bank is starting with, uh, after you mandated a bank like KFW IPEX, they could reach out and start the application process as the, as the German ESA or Judo Hermes here on the right with the, with the Eagle. Um, Judo Hermes has to do its own due diligence as well, for sure. We need to approve all the risks. It needs to be feasible for us. The risks need to be justifiable. If we agree to it, you will, you, the bank will receive like a preliminary approval from Judo Hermes. After receiving this approval, the bank, most likely the banks will consider and start then with you the negotiation of the loan agreement. And the loan agreement will be also closely linked to the commercial contract. This is quite important. After you find a solution and sign the loan agreement with, uh, with for example, in this case, KFW IPEX, um, the Udo Herm is then eager and uh, to um, yeah, finalize the guarantee and the guarantee will be then in full force and uh, in effect, and the exporter has to enter into a rescue uh, uh, recourse agreement with the, with the ministries and is obliged to fulfill also certain points of his contract that he ensures that he will also fulfill its obligations of the commercial contract that should be insured. And um, after receiving the guarantee, the exporter then could start with this capex delivery. And um, you, you, from your side, you, you have to hand over certain um, delivery document, documents or disbursement certificates which are needed for the disbursement for process of the bank. And then the bank will, after receiving these documents, start with the, with the disbursement. And up, to, up on the point four, um, reaching the point of completion or the mean delivery period after six months later, the buyer could start then to the three payment of the principal amount and the interest. And all that period will be then up to the last repayment would be covered by Euro Hermes. And also this provides a benefit for the bank to feel more uh, secured as well. And this is a very interesting structure, as I mentioned in the beginning, um, and or has been able, said several times today that you get long-term financing, so you get a quite uh, competitive um, pricing structure also included. It should be also benefit your activities. And if you have questions to the to this um, structure, you can reach out to me uh, after the webinar. Uh, just uh, ask me any questions you would like. And I would like to hand over now to, again, to the next slides, please. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Marcus. Uh, yeah, obviously we're running through things reasonably quickly today. So any questions at all, use the chat box or raise your hand later, or of course afterwards you can send us an email because I know there, there's a lot, uh, a lot of new terms and covering quite a lot of material you know, pretty pretty quickly. So please, please, please ask ask questions, any questions at all. Uh, now we of have course- We have already one question from Mr. Reka Prihandana. 
I already unmute your microphone. You may talk, Mr. Eka. Mr. Eka, you are raising your hand. Okay, then maybe no. Okay, <laughs> please continue, okay. Mr. Riley. Maybe later in the Q&A. Um, uh, whenever we're meeting clients, of course, one of the first things uh, everybody wants to know is, well, how much? And uh, of course, that's that's the right question. You know, this isn't a theoretical or just a theoretical uh, discussion or proposal. We, we, you know, we do think this is a good financing product that, uh, you know, may well fit some of your uh, financing requirements over the next couple of years, particularly in this kind of time of, uh, of stress and crisis. So, and it, it fits and it's good because it can be long-term and it can be competitive. So what do I mean by competitive? How does the pricing work? Uh, you know, how does it all add up? How does it compare to, you know, a, a syndicated loan or a, a bond? So I'll just run through some of the key mechanics. So. Essentially, with a with a loan, you will have a an ongoing finance uh, fu uh, ongoing funding cost. So this is what you would pay, you know, every every three months or every six months, and that's that's the same with an uh, with an ECA covered buyer credit, the, with an export financing. So you will have your base rate, which is typically six months U.S. dollar LIBOR. I mean, in, in Indonesia. The ECA deals are typically done in US dollars. Of course, there's sometimes in euro, sometimes in yen. Uh, we'll, we'll primarily, I'll just use US dollar LIBOR because that's the most common one. Um, so that's, yeah, that's the, the benchmark, right? Same as, as any other syndicated loan. You have an interest margin. Again, like any other, any other, US dollar loan, you'll pay an interest amount that's, you know, you agree up front with the bank and that will stay there the same throughout the life of the loan. Now, the interesting thing in an ECA deal is the interest margin is, relatively speaking, pretty low. Like the interest margin you will see on your term sheet will be a lot lower than if you go to, you know, a commercial, another commercial bank and ask for a syndicated loan. And the reason the interest margin is low we will go through this a little bit more in the next slide, is because the bank is not taking risk on you, the borrower, it's actually taking risk on the country of the ECA, largely, 95%. So if, for example, the ECA is the German ECA, that's a triple A risk the bank is taking. So of course, the interest margin associated on a triple A risk is very, is, is very low, essentially. Um, now, of course, it's not as quite as simple as that. It's not just cheap, cheap, cheap. Uh, the ECA charges an ECA premium. Now, the ECA premium is essentially the insurance or the guarantee fee. Like when you get car insurance, you know, you pay for it, right? Any type of insurance, you pay for it. ECA premium, that's what you, you, you pay the ECA for the insurance coverage they give to the bank. Now, that is an upfront cost, but it can be financed as part of the ECA loan, which means to all intents and purposes, you can look at it as an ongoing cost. You can amortize that ECA premium over the life of the loan. So for example, in Indonesia, typically it equates to about 0.8 to 1% per annum for an SOE. So if you have an interest margin of, we'll say again, maybe it's, we'll, for the sake of argument, we'll say 1%, and you have an ECA premium annualized equivalent to 0.8%, so you'll be paying six month LIBOR plus 1.8% per annum, roughly speaking. That's, that's how it will work on an ongoing basis. Now, of course, there's other costs, and again, these are like, most you know syndicated loans you'll see there's a commitment fee. So if you if you arrange this whole facility and you you know you you don't draw down or you, you draw down only partially, you will pay usually about half of the margin 
to the bank for having that loan available to you, it's the commitment fee. And then once the availability ends, then the commitment fee drops away. So it's usually not, um, you know, not something that borrowers are too, too worried about. The, the management fee or upfront fee or um, arranging fee is, again, similar to syndicated loans. It's, it's a one-off fee that you pay for the bank doing all of the work to arrange, structure, and um, pull it together. Again, it varies from maybe 0.5 to 1.5% flat on the facility amount. So if you were looking at a, you know, a non-recourse project financing greenfield project, you would expect to pay at the upper end of that scale. If you're a super large SOE, you're borrowing at the corporate level just for some, you know, in the scale of things, a relatively small facility, 50 or $100 million, you know, it'll be at the lower end of that scale. Uh, and then, of course, there's other startup costs. You'll have legal fees, uh, maybe some other due diligence, such as that of environmental, if it's, there's any dredging or, you know, land clearance and, and so on. Uh, and then you have ongoing agency fees, which, again, in the big scheme of them, things, are typically not too material, maybe 20 to 40,000 US dollars per annum. Uh, and that's how it works. And you can compare this to other hard currency, you know, corporate loans, syndicated loans very easily, because it's, it's, it's very, very similar, uh, just with the addition of the ECA premium. If you want to compare it to a bond, of course, a little bit more complicated, you would turn the six-month Eurobor or LIBOR, you would, you would find the equivalent swap rate, and you would add that to compare the bond to this. Uh, with local currency, of course, it gets even more tricky. You're looking at a, trying to equate the, the ECA loan with a cross-currency swap to what you can um, get from your local bank. So, but you can still do it. And of course, um, you know, we're, we're happy to, to have these discussions with you because if it's not competitive, if it's not cheaper or at least comparable, um, you know, we understand and you cannot propose it, you know, to your board. That's, that's understood. Now here on this slide, you'll see a list of what is it, eight, nine countries. And then the middle column is their sovereign rating. So Germany, AAA, Holland, or Netherlands, AAA, then Italy, triple B, and everywhere in between. On the third column, that is the name of their export credit agency. So the, the ECA that promotes uh, exports from their country. And we've obviously spoken about Hermes a lot, but all of the other OECD countries have have an equivalent ECA. Now the reason the sovereign rating is important, important, which I have I have briefly mentioned, is the sovereign rating and the, the, well, the, the sovereign rating and the rating of the ECA is what dictates the interest margin the bank will charge. So if it's Euler Hermes or Atreides, the interest margin will be at the lower end of the scale. It could even be, I mean, could be, I don't know, 0 0.6 or 7 percent, you know, and then it will start to to go higher and higher to 1.5 to maybe even 2 percent per annum at the lower end of the scale. Now, of course, it's not as simple as that, but just to give you some ideas in your head of where this scale roughly goes from yeah just below one percent to two percent so in in that range roughly that's that's where eca interest margins fall of course it can change uh you know in the european sovereign uh crisis those those rates you know changed a lot now it's uh it's stabilized and maybe it's it's, it's changing again it's um it is variable but it's 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 not um not as variable as you know corporate loans, for example. It's because they're sovereign. It's 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 usually there's always lenders willing to lend against this type of guarantee. And again, I know we've run through a lot. Please don't hesitate to ask questions at the end. Uh, put it in the chat box. Happy to to go through these in more more detail now or later. Um, Okay, this is an interesting, and again, this is extremely specific to just export 
financing, and, and not even all of the ECAs can actually offer this. This is called the commercial interest reference rate. And what that is, it's a fixed interest rate for your loan over the entire lifetime of the loan, drawdown period uh, plus the repayment period. So a fixed, a fixed rate loan. Now you can get that through a swap in the, you know, in the commercial markets for your commercial loans. But the interesting thing with this is that it's not really a typical, it's not really equivalent to, to what you get in the swap market because it's, it's backward looking. And it's, it's in some ways somewhat even a little bit subsidized, arguably. Now, if you can look at the, uh, if you look at the graph, maybe just, it, I don't expect you to be able to read the numbers on the screen, but essentially uh, on the left-hand side, it goes from 2008 all the way up to, you know, more or less to, to de today. And you can see, you know, GFC, it spiked. And then of course they cut interest rates, it fell, and it started to increase again. And this is US dollars. So if you go back a year and a half ago, it was about the commercial interest reference rate was was near enough to four percent to four and a half percent now it is below one and a half percent so it is you know fallen by like a third uh, sorry two thirds fallen by two thirds it's a third of what it was in in a period of 18 months and it's essentially at record it is at record lows so what i'm saying is the fixed interest rate you can get only when you use an ECA financing is at record lows. So if you move to the, the, the table on the left, you can see the actual rates available today. So I think less than five years is maybe not so much of interest to the audience we're talking about today. We already spoke infrastructure requires long-term lending. So five to 8.5 years, you can pay 1.27% fixed rate. Uh, over 8.5 years, 1.46%. Um, and then in the euro, because obviously euro interest rates are even lower, I mean, euro, Eurobor is, is, is heavily negative, uh, it's, it's extremely low. I mean, 0.42% for a you know, over 8.5 year loan. It's, um, it's quite, um, you know, quite, quite extraordinary at the moment, the rate. So, and I think for this type of long-term infrastructure assets, you know, fixed interest rates are a reasonable path to take. And because you're not doing a swap, these are not, you know, mark to market. You can't really, I mean, it'd be difficult to do that with these. It's not to say you can break them you, you, when you want, you, you can't, but it's, um, yeah, they're not really mark to market typically. Okay, I'll hand over to Jens. Yes, thank you, Rory. Um, as Marcus already explained to you in his graph, and where you see you and the supplier, obviously all the scheme of export financing is based on a supply contract. So basically, it is the financing is tied to the supply contract. And quite often in our discussion with uh, importers, we are hearing we're obviously, we are speaking to the financing department um, of the importers, and then they're saying, yeah, we want to do this investment, but we want to secure the financing first, and then obviously other colleagues will decide on the sub-supplies. Well, this doesn't work in this scheme. So obviously the discussion about financing and the discussion about supply contract has to become in the same same matter, in the same timing, and as it is tied. So we encourage you, uh, all the you you from the uh, financing world and financing department to speak with your procurement or engineering department as early as possible to identify what kind of potential suppliers could be play a role in your investments. So when you speak about ports, so which kind of grain manufacturers or dredging companies might be involved in respect of airports, what kind of baggage handling. Um, tower security, security equipment itself might be involved. In respect of road, which kind of construction material will be will be used, and all these things. Well, clarify this uh, this question. Get a list of potential suppliers, and this that will be the basis to discuss, for example, with us hopefully uh, a potential financing scheme, making use of export financing. A second 
answer we're quite often receiving from importers saying, yeah, we are doing this investment, but we have already entered into a contract with a local EPC. This is fine, and a contract with a local EPC doesn't harm you by using this scheme. Just remembering back on, on the graphic Markus showed to you with you and the supplier. So the EPC would stand in between. That would be you, EPC, and supplier. But still, you can make use of the scheme. So basically, the scheme works through the EPC to on the subcontractor uh, level uh, between the EPC and you. But again, it requires you to speak with your EPC and make your EPC as early as possible aware that you would like to use export financing. Because he has to speak with all the suppliers and has to make sure that the kind of bundling effect takes place. So, because in, if in case he is white scattering, buying from 1% from that country, 1% from another country, 5% uh, from country three, well, the scheme might be not really worthwhile to use because then it's too complex. But if he bundles the uh, supply contracts maybe from one or two countries, then it works perfectly. And he also has to take care about the uh, contracts so that the contracts are following the OECD consensus, for example, with a down, pay down payment of 15% and the 85% uh, pro rata delivery and services. So the message to you is yeah, speak with your engineering department as soon as possible or with your EPC in order to open the bucket to make this, uh, to use the scheme. Next slide, please. Guru. An aspect of timing, and Marcos and Roy already mentioned, um, it's good to think about the scheme early. And um, Marcus offered you his help in order to clarify all the questions on Euro Hermes specifics and ECA specifics. And obviously, uh, we are also there and to walk you through, to hand your hand and guide you through the entire process, which starts with clarifying the process indicative offer from our side, hopefully mandating KFW IPEX Bank as your bank for export financing, and then guide you through the process of CECA, through our, in, our internal process, and to get the approval of CECA, get the internal approval, prepares the documentation, and then executes the financing. And the process, if you start early, and if you, uh, if you let us guide you through, is not cumbersome, and um, it's normally done in three months time something like this is always a good proxy next slide please this is more like for reading later on but just to give you again the overview about the phases so informal inquiry just to identify whether this the project would fit to a scheme using export financing followed by an application process with cca and then obviously the approval process and lots of things can be done in parallel, so that at the end of the uh, at, at the end of the game, as mentioned, three months uh, is a good proxy to walk you through the entire process. Um, yeah, I would like to hand over again to Marcus, who gives you even more insights on the ECA financing done in Indonesia with you. Yes, thank you. I think we had a lot lot of information right now. How how we should work together as an importer side, the banking side included, uh, Yellow Hermes together to find a solution for your financing needs. I would like now to give you some information about Indonesia and some certain cover um, yeah, changes or measures which we have undertaken during the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, to start with Indonesia, on the left-hand side, we see here um, yeah, an explanation about uh, a graph is showing um, the, the newly cover volume of Indonesia for the last five years, up to 2018. Unfortunately, I don't have the numbers for 2019 available at the moment, but what we can see, it ranged about between 300 million up to 500 million. Um, we have experienced most likely uh, with short-term transactions, but also with mid-term to long-term transactions in the market. I would like to see more long-term transactions in the near future, and this is also the aim maybe of this today's webinar to emphasize on the opportunities also for you in the infrastructure and transportation sector. 
Um, Indonesia is, as I mentioned, from my personal perspective here, uh, from the competence center side, is very important here in Southeast Asia, also from from Yulo Hermes side. Um, it's still developing for us. We would like to see more transactions. Um, the cover policy for Indonesia is quite straightforward. There are no um, restrictions for the short-term related businesses, but also not for the medium and long-term related transactions. The country risk um, um, is a uh, country risk um, category is three out of seven, which is quite moderate in, in the region. And, and it's also quite uh, attractive to provide financing for it um, and also receive coverage from our side. Um, it's just to give you an idea, we, we have seen certain big scale projects in 2015, for example, but also in 2017 and, uh, and, and 18, and in several industries. And um, we would like to discuss with you more opportunities in the near future. And now I would like to go to the next slide, please. That's just a short overview what Euro Hermes has done during the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, there are a lot of improvements at the moment available for exporters and financing banks, but also benefiting and shifting the focus more clear to the importer side as well. First, we have the improved financing possibility for, for new exports. For example, we have now like a, a buyer credit structure in place uh, based on a bullet repayment structure up to 200 or up to two years which would be help you to, if you have uh, short financing needs, should you have provide you maybe a bridge financing for your project, should be also very beneficial for the for you as an investor side. On the other hand, we have now introduced for a couple of weeks the so-called shopping line. It's a very interesting um, new product um, for, the, I have to admit, for the top-notch clients uh, in the industries, which would be qualified for the highest um, um, buyer or the, for the highest rating from Euro Hermes itself. There may be several, a few clients in the markets who would be beneficial for this shopping line. The shopping line is like an umbrella credit structure. As a buyer credit structure, which provides you as an importer the the, the benefit. Maybe, for example, you you have, you are a large importer or you're a large company in, in Indonesia, and you have um, maybe a lot of needs for equipment from especially from Germany in the next two years, and maybe up to 200 or up to 100 to 200 million, you could uh, reach out for two banks like the KWI Apex to tell them, yeah, I would be interested in such a structure for all my upcoming projects. It could be not even one project could be 10 or 15 projects by itself or even smaller amounts. The idea is to pledge them all under one um, umbrella credit facility and they will receive coverage maybe up to 10 years or something. This could be quite interesting if you have a certain need in mind for the near future. We could discuss this on the server meeting further, not today, but just to give give you this information. It's really a focus from the buyer side from our uh, from our side as well. There are certain premium adjustments in the markets, for example, if there are certain delays um, due of COVID-19, um, this normally would um, also lead to an increase of the premium because the premium, uh, as mentioned, is a very important uh, instrument. It's, it's, it's the key factors of the premium, just to mention, are the country risk, uh, country risk section, the, the, the also our um, yeah, our counter risk uh, uh, counter risk it could be either an importer or either a bank who is involved uh, on the local basis. Could be also our risk uh, to provide a, a risk counterpart from a Euro Hermes perspective. And the <laughs> third very important um, factor is the <clears throat> the risk period. And also there could uh, is also delivery periods plays in a certain role, and this could be enhanced the premium or the, the premium if there if there is a delay but this is no uh, if it's a reasonable it will be delayed uh, will be delayed because of covid 19 the risk of the, uh, the euro hermes premium should be not affected by it there's also an improved option for refinance for banks providing export financing this was already explained <coughs> was already explained with the sir um, refinancing option from kfw ipex i don't want to go into detail to it there are also some other technical improvements for export grid guarantees for example there is now a um, um, full repayment, um, or if it's if in case of a default, uh, it could be now fully repayment in one lump sum for the for the applicant. Don't go further into detail. And also, what I would like to highlight, maybe also could be important for you in, on an on an infrastructure side. There is now a special initiative for renewable energy available. And in general, we learned today that we require at least a certain amount of German content 
to provide financing in general, the 50 plus one rule would, would count that even more than 50% should be sourced from Germany. For renewables, we would now accept um, foreign content even up to 70% of the contract value and only 30% per, 30 then related to Germany. We have also eased the requirements for um, due diligence processes, even specially based for project finance schemes in the renewable energy field. If it's a very straightforward wind farm, for example, then we would maybe accept a, a light uh, due diligence. Um, this should be then discussed on, an, on a case by case basis, just to keep in mind. And the key message of today is even in these complicated times, Yellow you know, Hermes hasn't changed its, its risk perspective. I mean, what we do right now is we would require from our applicants, either the bank or an exporter side, that they provide us with the last three annual reports of an importer or finance, uh, of the importers. And we would look then at the inner reports uh, on the basis of the last three years to get a better understanding about your business model. Was your business model quite feasible before COVID-19? Was it quite strong? Was it religious? legit, then we would maybe agree to provide financing. Even your company has some struggles during COVID-19. This could play a very important role to receive financing from Nudo Hermes as well. As this was just for you, a short overview besides what we already discussed about today, give you an idea that we are fully aware of the current situation. And there, this is only the tip of the iceberg. What, we are, what I mentioned here is several um, adjustments in place to support the industry. And also, it's not only beneficial for exporters and banks, but also from the importer side, it could be quite interesting to start a discussion with it. Yes, thank you. And next slide, please. Great, thanks, Marcus. Um, we're running out of time, so I won't go into too much detail with the case studies. Uh, you can look at them later and obviously again ask us questions, and we've already got a couple of questions coming in. So the key point with the case studies we want to highlight is, first of all, there are lots of ECA deals in Indonesia. Uh, PLN is definitely the number one user of ECA in Indonesia. They would have done deals with Euler Hermes, with uh, you know, the, the Finnish ECA, the Swiss ECA, the Japanese, the Koreans, the Chinese, uh, the US. Uh, they've done pretty much all of them. Um, but you would also have seen Wholesome Cement did ECA deals, um, Garuda's done ECA deals. Pasco Krakatau, uh, Krakatau Steel. There's, there's many, and obviously Palindo 3. So there's many ECA deals done in Indonesia. And the other point I want to get across is uh, ports and airports. Likewise, uh, you know, we're, this, is, this isn't theoretical. We do ECA deals for these types of sectors. So I won't go into this one. Um, this, I think Jens, I think it would be maybe good to just briefly um, introduce this, uh, the airport one that we did. It's quite interesting, I think. Yeah, so just uh, uh, one sentence to this. So it's an example from Africa, but what it makes interesting is, so the ECA covered financing was used here for all the equipment which is inside the terminal, all the uh, cranes handling, uh, cargo handling equipment, cooling and all the things. So this was a non-concessional ECA covered financing covered by Euler Hermes. All the outside, so the engineering construction of the terminal itself was a concessional financing by the, provided by the French Development Bank AFD. So even concessional, non-concessional financing can be uh, combined here. And um, to, uh, to, to be open fair to you, the non-concessional financing at the end of the day was even cheaper than the concessional financing. So just as a side effect, but uh, just to give you, so. If the project is good and you look at the supplies and uh, bundling your supplies just from one or two countries, then even if it's not for the entire project, you can use it for half of it, and uh, it is not too much of it's not it adds not too much of complexity to it, uh, and obviously you can save some money at the end of the day. And um, yeah, I think we're coming now to the end. I think the last couple of questions were really, I think, it's more for, for reading later on uh, for all the participants. So um, I would like to say thank you to you um, from Rory and myself. And we are very happy now to see all your questions. We already have seen some questions. So one question coming in was asking whether the source system, which has been mentioned, the German source system, 
uh, if you have to apply for it before the supply contract has been signed. Um, this is not required in Germany, so even you can apply for the source system, uh, although the supply contract has been already signed. Uh, so, yes, now we are coming actually to the question and answer session. Someone has any questions, just raise your hand, um, click the raise hand option, or you may address your question in the chat box. Someone, maybe? <laughs> Okay, but I have some questions actually. So um, the first one is um, well, I have I heard about the uh, export credit agency has lots of questions and the process is time consuming. Is this true? Is it different to an international syndicate loan process? Thanks, Olivia. Uh, I'll, I'll handle this and then Jens maybe chip in uh, afterwards. Uh, I, I would say it's maybe a little bit more, you know, there is a little bit more to it than just a, uh, you know, dealing with your, your, your local bank or perhaps, uh, you know, your other international partner bank on, you know, a bilateral loan. There is a bit more. Um, but if you work alongside an experienced partner, uh, and, and okay, we're obviously definitely one of the best when it comes to doing ECI deals, but there are there are several other banks as well, of course. As long as you work with an experienced partner, then you know you should know in advance exactly what you've got to do and how to do it. And okay, there are some more forms to fill in and so on, but it's not it's not complicated. Um, if you're organised, uh, as Yen said, it's you know three months now. Okay, this is for a corporate deal. If you're doing project finance, I mean project finance always takes longer. It's six months um, to, I mean, again, it depends. It's usually, the ECA financing is not usually the thing that holds things up. There's, there's other things going on. It's um, a little bit more to it, but with an experienced partner, not, not too hard. Yes, I, I tend to agree with you, Rory. So for one-time users, it might be a little bit more complex because other terms, other players of, uh, are being part of the entire things, but there are lots of helping hands like from Marcos and from ourselves to guide one-time users through the entire process and from the second time onwards, they already feel that they get quite used to it. And in Indonesia, we have seen PNN, for example, using it quite a lot. So they have come through the cycle and now using exactly what they have to do. Yeah, okay. I also would like to add um, the, what was mentioned already all the time today is uh, you should very in include us quite early, even you're in the discussion with your exporter, maybe negotiating the contract, maybe already think about a financing option on top, reach out to KFW IPEX, you could reach out to myself in the region. We could then try to support you and um, provide you, help you to find a structure which would be then eligible for your Hermes. And if you involve myself, I will pre-discuss your transaction then already with your Hermes, get an idea of what is eligible, mm -hmm. what can we do. That's the basic idea. Um, you should not be hesitate. Anything, what project you have in mind um, could be discussed. We will see if it works out uh, from our side and then we will find a way to maybe or even faster in the process later from Euro Hermes. And I'm also here, maybe it's a tricky project. I could visit your project site, get in contact with you and provide clearance for Euro Hermes for the German ECA. This was not possible in the past, but right now, even during the application process and the due diligence from Euro Hermes, there's also now an option available where we could step in here on, on an export finance uh, perspective locally. Thank you. Okay, I see. Thank you. Um, is there is a minimum amount of CAPEX required to make an ECA financing worthwhile? Uh, I would like to answer, not, not at all. I mean, uh, <laughs> from a banking side, I think you might have some restrictions, but we only talked about today about the buyer's credit scheme and i will let you talk about it soon later but from an eca side you could also reach out to an exporter and ask him to provide you maybe a, a long-term 
financing uh, corporate loan structure could be also able from our side and I have discussions here in the region which started up of 250,000 euros very small equipment small machineries there's from an ECA perspective there's no limitation but maybe okay. you from the banking side yeah should from, from financing side yes but um, well the minimum would be roughly 10 million euro or dollar and the sky is the limit, so upwards, there's, there's no limit. Okay. Um, can ECA financing be done in local currency? I, oh, let me think. Yes, we would. I'm not sure if we already have done it. Um, I think we had certain inquiries for for Indonesia. And I had a contact with my uh, country risk colleagues and they explained me they would be eager to look at it and it would be decided on a case by case basis. Maybe it would be it would be an optional. We would, I would not say no, we need to approve it uh, during the process, but it's still, um, there's no no from our side. Um, it seems so that we could get a green light, but it's, it's a case by case um, analysis also in the end and therefore, um, that this would be decided on during the application process, but it's uh, almost likely that we'll receive maybe a yes for it, yes. Okay, so, but basically depends on the project, but for sure, yes, it can be considered, right? It, it will be considered, okay. but it need to be uh, approved during the, the application process on a case-by-case -case basis, yes. Yeah, okay. I, I had experience once uh, quite, quite a few years ago now, maybe five, six years ago, uh, in the cement industry, and again, of course, cement is a it's a, it's a local currency revenue business, and uh, it was two large cement plants, about 700 million US dollars. They were looking to raise, and um, we had a lot of conversations with uh, one of the Scandinavian ECAs about doing it in. We were looking at all the different options: dollars, euros, and Indonesian rupiah, and. Uh, it didn't go ahead, um, but that was the borrower's decision. The ECA did provide approval and pricing and everything was set up for uh, for local currency, so uh, in, in Indonesian rupiah. For, and like I said, it was $700 million, so it would have been, I don't know, 500 maybe of debt. So it is, it is possible. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, another question is ECA financing only applicable for new or greenfield development? Yes, indeed. We have to consider it, we have to analyze the project, but yes, it would be considered. It can be considered. Okay, what does come first, financing or identification of export? Can you repeat oh, the question? Yes. <laughs> Could you repeat Maybe the question? Yeah, what does come first, financing or identification of export? Oh, okay, financing. Well, that's a good question, actually. I, I've seen both. <laughs> I mean, if you're in a country, like to be honest, in Indonesia, I would say you're probably going to have a separate process. You want the best, you know, you want the best equipment for you. In countries where the biggest challenge is financing. You sometimes might actually, yes, look at the financing as the main driver of, of everything. So in, in, in African countries, for example, where you know getting a ten over a 10 year loan is almost impossible, you might actually try and find the financing first and then you know get all the equipment that helps you kind of actually close that financing. Whereas in Indonesia, what we typically see is, I mean, there's a couple of different ways, but you might have, um, I mean, you might have, for example, a short, the procurement team might shortlist, say, three, three different bidders, you know, and it's often, you know, one from Finland, one from Japan, one from China, say, or one from Germany, um, and, you know, they will have they will have a process on the procurement side, so there'll be you know a scoring system for the, the equipment and the services associated with that. And then they might also insist that the, the 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 bidder provides a financing proposal based on ECA financing. And you know, then they can look at the cost of the, you know, assuming the, the, the equipment meets the minimum you know requirements, 
um, what's the cheapest financing then? So what's the cost of the equipment alongside what's the cheapest financing? And they can look at the, you know, they can, if they really want, look at the whole life cycle cost, including the financing. So there's, there's different ways, uh, there's different ways to do it, to be honest. Not, not, a, not, a, not a straightforward uh, question or answer. No, it's okay. okay only at VC both ways. Also, when I'm when I'm often I know that the exporters are in quite hard, hard competition, especially in Asia, even from China, from from Japan or something. And then financing plays in the end the the crucial point for what can be provided cheapest solution. But still, made in Germany as an from a supplier side, it's still a strong value. And um, you have to consider sometimes if you have maybe. A, cheaper equipment from china um, less durable or you, you you reach out for maybe long durable supplies from germany that's sometimes also an argument it depends on your strategy for, as a company uh, you, what you have to consider and what you would like to consider yes i have one question from miss annie santia stuti how about financing for shipbuilding industry would like to answer maybe Mr. Jens or Mr. Ryrie? Oh, I, I can answer this. So um, in general, um, yeah, ECA covered financing for shipbuildings is also provided. So um, obviously it needs then these supplies, for example, from Germany for the engines and all the things. But we have done a lot of these financings where the vessels uh, have been constructed in shipyards in Korea or China but uh, mm -hmm. contain lots of sub supplies, for example, from Germany or other European countries. So in general, the answer is yes, uh, can can be done. Okay, so in, in Indonesia, it's quite tough because the, the vessels, if they operate within domestic waters, have to be flagged with the Indonesian flag. And most banks, from a collateral perspective, don't put uh, much value on, on the vessel, if that's the case. So. I did a, a, an FSRU, the Floating Storage Regas Regasification Unit, um, in Indonesia that had Korean ECA uh, cover. But the reason that worked is essentially it's more the, it's the, the contract. So it was a long term contract with, I think it was PGN. And, and that's what gives the deal, that's the collateral almost, is, is that long term offtake contract. The, the vessel itself, once it's flagged with an Indonesian flag, it's, it's tough for banks to look at it. The asset value of it. So you don't see too many ECA covered shipping deals for Indonesian borrowers. Uh, it's it's yeah it's it's technically possible. And I know I think other banks like I said I've done one, but it's it's not not that common. But again, happy to we're we're one of the largest ship financiers around. I would say top I don't know top 10, 20 in the world. Um, depends how you count it, but. Um, yeah, happy to happy to have uh, you know a separate conversation if you do if you are looking at uh, financing uh, ships. Okay, another question from her. Um, how do you categorize this industry? Is it infrastructure? So um, you are supporting uh, project financing for infrastructure in terms of shipbuilding for let's say um, port business only or also um, other other um, project finance in terms of shipbuilding industry, only port business or how is it? Well, uh, Rory and myself, so we are representing uh, infrastructure as a transport infrastructure sector within our bank and our bank is divided into business sectors and we also have uh, maritime industries, which is basically uh, ships and uh, everything which is uh, running on the sea. Uh, we have aviation, we have uh, basic industries, which is basically metals and mining, um, but also basic, uh, also industry and services, so lots of other sectors which we are covering. So, and uh, ports okay. would be part of our responsibilities within transportation. Uh, we, we would look at PPPs as well, so I mean in Indonesia it's 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 tough. They're, you know, they're typical local, the typically local currency, and the, the the concession agreements are obviously very, you know, domestic orientated. But we do a lot of PPPs globally. In APAC, it's mostly Australia. They're availability-based uh, PPPs. Uh, we we are looking. I mean, it's it's not 
it's not moving particularly fast. We are looking at one availability-based PPP in, in Indonesia. And um, yeah, so any, any anytime there's long-term lending uh, and there's CapEx, we probably have some department that can look at it. If you take mm -hmm. away coal and you take away real estate, I would say, uh, that's they're the two areas we don't um, we don't cover. Okay, last question from Mr. Mati Malminand. Any news if more like made in Indonesia is required in the project, mainly ports? That's one for our audience, I think. <laughs> <laughs> So, well, just, just, uh, we, we know about the local content, but there are uh, many products that cannot be produced in Indonesia. So that's why we have this export credit agency here um, to support that kind of product. So um, we can still produce uh, or manufacture by ourselves, but then maybe some parts we can take from Germany or maybe from other countries, I would say so. Yeah, so um, thank you, Mr. Ari Brown, Mr. Marcus Lyhum, and Mr. Jens Oliver Schinzel for the valuable insight. Uh, now we will again conduct a short survey. Please vote on questions that appear on your display. I will leave them open for a certain time to get the result. So, do you think export financing may be relevant to your business over the next two years? So, steer collecting process. Okay. So, yes, 70% are saying yes. So, uh, it's quite, a, quite relevant for them. Okay, great. Thank you. So, um, yeah, as you have learned from the presentation of our speaker, it gives you an understanding of what Alternative KFA EPEX Bank offers, why this financing model can really help your company, especially in project financing or uh, uh, financing of imported products that possibly cannot be produced in Indonesia. The option is not only available for products from Germany, if I'm not wrong, but also from other European countries. So it is highly recommended to bundle the required products from one country to simplify uh, simplify the financing process. So, all right, um, should you have still uh, more questions about KfW, uh, KFW, IFEX GmbH, uh, and their financing models maybe, please feel free to contact our speaker directly. Um, email address and telephone numbers can be found in the presentation shared after this present uh, after this event. Please also note that Econit organized many interesting webinars, so please make sure that you are always connected to Econit via LinkedIn or even visit the Econit website www.econit.com. So um, yeah, finally we ask you to take the time to fill out uh, our survey with your feedback. Your insight will help us to shape our future events. After filling out the survey presentation, letter will be sent to your email. So um, on behalf of the German Indonesian Chamber of Industry and E-Commerce and Commerce, we thank you for your participation. We hope that the information provided can facilitate your future plans to support your business. See you at the next Econi webinar. Stay healthy and stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Have a nice day. Bye. Have a nice day. Bye. Have a nice day. Sama-sama, Pa, Jens.